great to see you today. Thank you so much for being a part of our service. If you're in the room, thank you for being here. If you're online, thank you for joining us today. Well, uh, we've already talked about it a little bit, but let me remind you that next Sunday is Mother's Day. How many moms do we have in the room? Raise your hand. You're a mom. Awesome. Look, if you're a mother, you can make sure if your kids are around here that they come to church with you. You say, well, how do I do that? I can't hardly get them to do anything. Use what is a God-given gift, the ability to put a guilt trip on your kids, all right? I mean, moms are really, really good at that, right? And look, I'm not saying that you didn't earn that because you carried them in your body. You gave birth to them through your body. You fed them with your body. You earn the right to put a little guilt on them occasionally. So, so use it for good. You've done it all your life anyway, all their life. You've uh, just put the guilt trip on them for different things. My mom, i never forget this. I must have been about 14 years old. And uh, we didn't have an ice maker. We had a refrigerator with a freezer on it, but it was, had the ice trays you had to fill up with water. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So you had to do that. And I was notorious for getting the ice out of the ice tray without refilling it and putting it back in the freezer because I was a lazy boy, all right? So um, anyway, I'll never forget this. My mom went to get some ice for a drink, and there was one ice cube left in all the ice trays, one, and she about lost it. She went into this guilt mode. I went down into the jaws of death to bring you into this world. And I'm like, oh my goodness, mom's having an aneurysm. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, what? What? She says, I almost died bringing you into this world. And her lips were trembling and her chin was quivering. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what is going on? And she said, and I quote, you would think you could put some water in the ice tray. (laughs) And and moms, look, I, I know that you get that, okay? And you have earned that. Use it for good. Next Sunday... Get your kids to come to church with you. If your mom lives in the area, if she's still living, get her to come to church with you. It'll be a great, great opportunity uh, for us. Now, today, I'm going to talk to you about a very famous passage of Scripture, a very famous story in the Bible. Last week, we talked about the feeding of the 5,000, and that's a very famous story as well. And then right on the heels of that, Right, just hours after Jesus had fed 5,000 men and their families with five loaves and two fish, a miracle, he did another miracle that I want you to see today. He walked on water. Now, we've all heard of this miracle. We've all heard this story. Now, I've never seen a person walk on water. I've never walked on water myself, but I think I came close one time. You say, do tell. All right, let me tell you. About years ago, I was a youth pastor and uh, in the state of Florida. We were in North Florida, and uh, we had this youth activity. We had a lot of high school kids go on this youth activity. We had a whole busload of kids, and we went from Jacksonville, Florida, where we lived, to the Okefenokee Swamp in South Georgia, North Florida. Anybody ever been there? You know what I'm talking about. You know, as well as I do, if you've been there, that swamp is famous famous for the number of alligators that it has. Now, why they rent out boats and canoes in an alligator-infested swamp, I don't know. But we were dumb enough to do it, so I had this whole busload of kids. And uh, when I got there, I'd made arrangements. I was the only one. All the other kids had canoes and oars, paddles, you know. I had a little motorboat. You say, why was that? Because I was in charge. That's why. So, uh, well, actually, there was a reason Um, we had girls on the trip and I knew that they weren't coordinated enough to, you know, row and keep the boat, the the canoe. Some of you are glaring at me. Okay. I I realize I'm talking about city girls. Okay. These are city girls. They couldn't do this. And so anyway, my plan was to keep them all together so that it wouldn't get spread out through thousands and thousands of acres of a swamp. So uh, the girls and the guys that couldn't paddle uh, and keep the boat straight, I'd go pick them and I'd bring them back up to the, uh, the, the group. And uh, so that's what we did. 
Now, I'd warn them repeatedly, do not turn over your canoe. And why is that, class? Because there are alligators in the water. That's why. And everywhere we went, we saw alligators. Not a allig- an alligator occasionally. I mean, there were literally dozens and dozens and dozens everywhere we w- looked. I mean, they were everywhere, okay? So I warned the, these kids, especially the boys, because you know as well as I do, there's not many things on this planet that are, how shall I say, dumber than a high school boy, right? So maybe I shouldn't use that word, but nevertheless, uh, let me tell you the rest of the story and you can draw your own conclusion. We had these boys, I told them not to turn over the boat, and as I was going back and forth, bringing people up to the group that could not paddle straight, we had two boys in their brilliance decided that in an alligator-infested swamp, What they would do would be to stand on the edges of the canoe, okay, not in the canoe, on the edges of the canoe, and with their swords, they pretended to be knights, and they they were sword fighting, they were jousting with their oars. Yeah, smart, right? Okay, so anyway, uh, it didn't take long, uh, as you can imagine, before they turned their canoe over, and fell into the water. Now, there was a gigantic alligator on the, the shore, on the bank, right next to where these boys had their canoe. I don't know if they didn't see it. I don't know if they just completely ignored my advice not to turn their canoe over in an alligator-infested swamp, but there they were, there was this giant gator, and I mean giant. He was very, very large, definitely large enough to eat two boys, all right? So um, anyway, uh, and I, what I did was I was like, I kind of panicked a little bit because I'm like, oh my goodness, because as soon as their boat was turned over, their canoe turned over, that gator hit the water just like that. He was coming toward them. And so here was my reaction. I'm in my little motorboat, um, and I, I, I saw these boys, they were in the water. They had turned over their canoe like a bunch of dummies. And I'm like, oh no. And I turned to see where the gator was, which was coming, and it was coming fast. And I turned back around, and the boys were in my boat. I have no idea how they got there that fast. <laughs> I suspect they may have walked on water. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But... All joking aside, Jesus actually did walk on water. And you know, if you read that story or hear that story, and I've heard some preachers that kind of miss the point. If in walking on water, and you know the story how that Jesus walked on water, and it's not in the passage we're going to read today, but you find you remember that also Simon Peter walked on water. Remember, they saw, they thought they saw a ghost. Jesus said, if Uh, You know, you have faith, come on out to me. And Peter stepped out of the boat. Incredible. But you know that he began to sink. And there are lots of people that have drawn lots of inspirational stories and thoughts from that. Uh, For example, there are people that they read that story and they hear that story and they think, well, what that means is you got to believe in yourself. Well, I'm not against believing in yourself, but that's not the point of that story. Or, or, or people say, well, you know, you got to be willing to take risks. And, and I, I've, I've even read a book called, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Get a Get Out of the Boat, which is true, okay? And it certainly does help us reflect on faith and the importance of taking risks in faith. But I want to answer this question today. Maybe you've never thought of it. Maybe you didn't think it was relevant, but I think it's very relevant And I think it's extremely important that we can look at this story and answer it the way that God wants us to answer it. And here's the question, why did Jesus walk on water? I mean, we know that he could. And I've heard some people, you know, comedians talk about how hard it was to get his mother to get him a bath because he kept on standing on water as a little baby. Now, I don't know about that, but I do know this. Jesus walked on water. Was it hard for him to walk on water? No. Was it 
A miracle? Yes. Uh, because Jesus walked on water, there's some meaning to that. And the reason we know that, because in the story, you'll read that Jesus got upset with the disciples. Now think about this. If you read the story of feeding the 5,000 and walking on water together in, uh, in context, you realize that Jesus said about the disciples, they saw the miracle of him feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish and them, uh, them walking on water. Here's what he said. They had hard hearts. That's an interesting observation, isn't it? They had hard hearts. I mean, if I walked on water and I saw how people were responding and uh, they were just amazed and all this stuff, that my first thought would not be, well, these are hard-hearted people. And why would he say that? Why would he say that they had missed the obvious meaning when he fed the 5,000 and he walked on water? That's because there was a reason that he did it. Okay, and once again, it's not about believing in yourself. It's not about, um, you know, trying to take risks in faith. There's certainly nothing wrong with making applications like that. But there's a reason that Jesus did this. And I want to point it out to you today. I really have three reasons. Uh, what God did here, what Jesus did, was to reveal himself self as the creator, to reveal himself as God, and to let people know that they needed a Savior. That was really the point. You say, why so? Because anyone that has the power over the natural, over the elements... You'd have to say that a person that can take five loaves of bread and two fish and feed over 5,000 people with it, that person is not limited by the creation. He's not limited by the natural. He's not limited by time and space, right? And so that person must be God. That person uh, has no limitation on himself. A person that can walk on water, that's not normal. That's not natural. That's not somebody you're just going to go up to and high five and say, hey, buddy, let me tell you the latest joke. Why? Because that person is demonstrating something to you, that he is above nature, that he is above the natural, that he has power over everything. Jesus has power over the elements. Jesus has power over nature itself. He has power over science and chemistry and physics and everything that we can think about. Jesus has the power. Why? He is the creator. That's why. And, and, and one of the things that Jesus was obviously doing was to show that he is God. To show that he is the creator and that he's God in human form. And he reveals himself to us. Now, the real purpose here of Jesus walk, walking on water, and I want you to get this, you may have never thought about this, it was for us. It was for us. He said, well, how, how does that work? Why does that have to do with uh, us just because Jesus walked on water? Why was it for us? Why was it for the disciples? Why was it that he did this to demonstrate something uh, for us? Well, let's read in Mark chapter 6 and verses 45 to 52. And this was after Jesus had uh, fed the 5,000 5, men plus their families with five loaves and two fish, and he, he went to pray. And it says, immediately after this event, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. And while he dismissed the crowd, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out at sea, it was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. So right, get the picture. He had sent the disciples away. There's this great miracle, a miracle of feeding 5,000 people with five loaves, two fish. He's demonstrating his deity. He's demonstrating that he's God. He's demonstrating that he has all power, no matter what, okay? Then he sends the disciples on, on ahead. Okay. He goes up in the mountain to pray. He was alone on the land. And when he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind 
was against them. Now, now I want you to get this. Jesus sent them out into a storm. Did he know there was going to be a storm? Yes. Was he worried about the storm? No. Remember, he just fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. He has power over the elements. He has power over nature. He has power over everything. Now he sends them out. And the interesting observation here, uh, I don't know, you know, it just seems kind of interesting to me. He noticed that they were struggling. Duh. I mean, they're out in the middle of a storm on a lake. And he noticed that they were painfully making progress. You ever been there? You ever feel like that life is just like that? You're in the middle of a storm. You're in the middle of a raging sea. And every step that you make, every inch of ground that you take, it seems like you take one step forward and two steps back. Jesus was noticing this. And, and I want you to understand, he does not miss your circumstances. He knows them. He has a plan for them. He's not afraid of it. He has power over the elements. He has power over nature. He has power over your circumstances. Don't miss this. He said, and I'm going to read it again. He saw that they were making headway painfully. They were struggling. Jesus never misses a shed tear. Jesus never misses a moment of depression. Jesus never misses when you lose heart. Jesus never misses when you are struggling, no matter what it is. You're struggling at your job, he knows. You're struggling with your family. He knows. You're struggling with a decision. Maybe you're struggling. You're trying to quit doing something that you shouldn't do. And it's painful. And you're taking little tiny steps. You're making an effort. He notices. He knows. Don't ever think that he does not know what you're going through. The Bible tells us that he was tempted in all points like as we are. Yet he was without sin. He knows what you're going through. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to struggle. He knows what it's like to feel rejection. He knows. He knows what it feels like to feel alone. He knows what it feels like to have the Father turn his back on you. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was actually quoting an Old Testament scripture, but I believe he was crying out to the Heavenly Father as well. Now this is, and I, I don't want to get too technical and too confusing, but this is God, the Son, crying out to God, the Father, okay? One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, okay? So my point is simple. He knows. He knows when you're struggling against the wind. And then about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them about 3 a.m. About the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. That's interesting. Um, and then, y'all please forgive me, I'm struggling with this little earpiece here. It keeps on falling off. Every time I speak, move my jaw, it falls off. So, uh, that's why I, I'm not, you know, I don't have Tourette syndrome or anything like that, okay? So some of you are like, oh no, there's something wrong with the pastor. Well, there's probably something wrong with me, but this is because this thing keeps on falling off my ear. Well, he meant to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost. That's a pretty natural reaction, isn't it? I mean, you know, if I see somebody walking on water, I'm going to be shocked and surprised as well. They thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. I love this. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus wants us to take heart, no matter what 
or struggling with, no matter how difficult the wind may be blowing against you, take heart. As I, I'm here. That's what he's saying. I'm with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And don't be afraid. Man, what great advice to live by. What great hope and faith and scripture to live by. He said, don't be afraid. And then he got in the boat with them and the wind ceased. It says in the other gospels about this story that he commanded the wind and waves to cease. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? I mean, he has power over the elements. He fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Uh, He has power over the wind and the storms of life. He could walk on water. He was not bothered by the storm. He knew the disciples were going into a storm, but he wasn't afraid. He wasn't worried. Why? Because he said, it is I. I'm here with you. Don't be afraid. He knew he was going to be with them. And he knew that they would come out on the other side. And then I want you to really, this is what I want you really to think about. And they were utterly astounded, which, I mean, you know, once again, understatement of the year, right? Person walking on water, they invite one of your crew out to walk on water. He walks on water, starts to sink because he gets his eyes off of Jesus. Uh, He prays, Lord, save me. Jesus did. And then they get in the boat and the seas and the winds calm. Who wouldn't be astounded? I would be. They were amazed. But then I want you to see why. For they did not understand about the loaves. Remember that just had happened. Just the the previous day. Jesus did it for a reason and they missed the point. They saw it as, you know, Jesus was able to do little magical things. And uh, it was just amazing how much... He was able to do, and it's good to hang out with Jesus because he can feed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. He can make the wind stop. He can calm a storm. He can walk on water. Great to hang out with Jesus. But I think that they missed the point, and a lot of times we miss the point too. It's not just about what he does for us. It's not just about the good things he can do. It's not just about the fact that he can feed you when you're hungry. It's not just about the fact that he can calm a storm when you're in the middle of it. It is who he is that should so amaze us. They misunderstood. Why? Because they were looking at the event rather than the person. And what you and I often do is we will look at the circumstances around us rather than looking at the person of Jesus Christ. We'll worry about our job and we'll worry about the economy and we'll worry about our kids and our family and we'll worry about our health. And we look at all the circumstances around us when our eyes should be focused on the person, not the problem. And I think this is really what Jesus wants to see. It says, they were utterly astounded for they did not understand about the loaves, but their heart was hardened. Well, I want to just reveal to you what I believe that we should get from this story. Three things, three reasons why Jesus walked on water. Number one, Jesus walked on water to reveal who he really is. He revealed his divinity. He revealed that he is God. You know that the Old Testament describes God as the one who walks on water? Did you know that? Listen to at least two verses that that show us this. Job 9.8. He alone, talking about God, has spread out the heavens and marches on the waves of the sea. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Psalm 77.19. Once again, talking about God. You walk through the waves, you cross the deep sea, but your footprints could not be seen. Wow, sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? And and the point is, he wants us to understand that he is God, okay? But then I think he also wants to understand his authority. Because when Jesus walked on water, it revealed his divinity, but it also revealed his authority. In fact, he has authority over your hunger, 
over your food, over your lack. When, they, when he fed 5,000, they were all in need. He has authority over that. He had authority over the storms, over the wind and the waves and the sea. He noticed that they were struggling to make progress because of the wind. He knew that. He saw that. He was revealing his authority. Uh, Jesus shows us in this act that not only is he creator, but he is also completer. You see, how do you get that? Because what Jesus was trying to get them to recognize is that they needed to turn to him as God. They needed to turn to him for help. They needed to turn to him for their storms. They needed to turn to him for their provision. They needed to turn to him for their purpose. You see, he was stirring these guys up, these disciples. That some of them were fishermen, some of them were tax collectors, some of them were zealots, and uh, you know, some of them were revolutionaries. Okay, they all came from different backgrounds, but he wanted to unite them into one purpose to show. Because he eventually said to them, I'm going to make you fishers of men. In other words, he wanted them to see that there was a far greater purpose in life than just putting food on the table, than just making it through a storm, than, than just understanding that, you know, you have needs. What God was showing us is that in every instance in life, in every circumstance in life, He is God, He has authority. And we must turn to him. You want peace? You know how the disciples got peace? When Jesus was in the boat with them. That's how they got peace. It wasn't simply because a storm or a lack of storm. You know what? We all have storms. And we all go through times when we lack peace. And sometimes life can even be good when we lack peace. And God wants you to know that when Jesus is in the boat with you is when you'll have peace. Well, Jesus walked on water to reveal who he really is. That was his main purpose. Then I think Jesus walked on water so that you will trust him in a storm. So you'll trust him when there's a storm brewing around you. Let me tell you, there are always going to be storms. There are always going to be problems. There are always going to be difficulties. What I find interesting is that Jesus knew a storm was coming, but he sent, it, sent them into it anyway. They could have avoided that. Couldn't he have calmed the storm before they went into it? Of course he could have. But once again, sometimes the storms of life reveal who he is. And maybe you're going through difficulty. Maybe you're in a storm and you don't understand. If you'll not have a hard heart like the disciples did... And you'll turn to Jesus. You know what will begin to happen? You'll begin to see him for who he really is. And you'll be amazed. You'll have peace. You'll find purpose. Jesus knew a storm was coming. He knew that he would be with them in the storm. And he knew the storm would not defeat them. Do you know he knows the same thing about you? He knows that if you'll turn to him, if you'll trust him, you will not be defeated. Now, I'm not talking about two Christian high school football teams that both, you know, claim I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and they believe that the one that God likes the best is going to be the one that wins the football game, okay? I, I've been around Christian schools. I graduated from a Christian school. I know what that's like. You know, you're like, oh, we can do all things through Christ. Well, the other team's saying that too. Somebody's going to lose, all right? And, you know, Sometimes we, um, we forget that circumstances are there for a reason. God wants us to understand that we can trust him in the middle of a storm. We can trust him in things that are not going exactly right. And, and then let me give you this last thought and we're done. And this is where I want to bring it home. Jesus walked on water to help you Examine your heart. You say, where do you get that? Well, you remember we read, he said, you know, their hearts are hardened. They misunderstood. 
So obviously what Jesus was doing, I mean very obviously from that, he was trying to get a reaction from them, a response from them. He was trying to get them to understand something. And for you and me, we will often misunderstand, just like the disciples did. When we're seeing God at work, when we're in the middle of a problem, because we miss seeing Jesus for who He is. Now look, I realize that sometimes preachers can say things that maybe don't make sense. I mean, they make sense, but you don't know how they work. I mean, for example, just what I just said you got to see Jesus and everything. And we're like, oh, that's so awesome. I have no idea what that means, but, you know, I don't know how to do that. You know, we'll say things like, you know, you got to put God first in your life. We'll say things like, you got to serve the Lord. And you're like, amen. What does that mean? Does that mean I got to go to church seven days a week? Does that mean I got to hang out there? I got to read the Bible 10 hours a day? What does that mean? Well, Jesus walked on water to help you examine your heart. And and I realize that it's easy in the culture that we live in especially to want to be spoon-fed everything, okay? We want five steps to becoming a millionaire, right? Do these five things. The number one being buy my program, right? So, uh, you, you know, that's five steps of that person becoming a millionaire, right? We, 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 uh, we want it now. We, oh, five simple, easy steps to being a great Christian. Now, there are some steps and there are some things you should do. But I want you to understand, it's not always that easy. Sometimes, listen, sometimes you've got to examine your heart. You got to think about it, not just go through the rote. We're good at that. We can get a habit, and I, and I believe in good habits. And we get that going, and we're like, oh, that's what I'm going to do. And we, do, we get to the point where we do it almost without thinking. But I want you to see that one of the things that I believe we can glean from this passage is they needed to examine their heart, they needed to, to look on the inside. And that's what I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you to examine your heart. Notice the two phrases. He said to take heart. And then the last verse says their heart was hardened. Now, in that day, when they would refer to the heart, they weren't talking about the organ that pumps your blood, like in the same way we don't today. Uh, We say things like, I love you with all my heart right? And that means all your emotions and will and so on and so forth. Well, in that day, the heart was the seat of understanding, the seat of thought, okay? Not just feelings, but it was where your intellect, your will, uh, your decision-making, that was what it was meant by the heart. Their heart was hardened. Didn't mean they didn't like Jesus. Didn't mean that they were like, oh man, I can't believe I got to hang out with him again today. It didn't mean that they were like, oh my goodness, why is he in the boat? Does he not realize that Peter is back there getting ready to smoke a cigarette and now he can't do that, right? No, it wasn't that. What was it? It is about your mind and your decision making and ultimately, let me just kind of make this point point. we're done. It's really about repentance. Now, I've told you repeatedly that the word repentance is a beautiful word. I know when we think of it in our modern context, we think about a, a preacher with a long bony finger pointing his finger at you. You need to repent. Well, the word repent, you know what it means? And I've told you this, you probably already know it. It just simply means to change your mind means to change your thinking. It literally means to agree with God. When God looks at your life and he says, you're in the middle of a storm, you think Jesus knew that? And you're like, yeah, I agree. I've, I'm, you're right. I got to change my thinking. That's what repentance means. And what Jesus was doing 
was he was helping them not to have a hard heart. In other words, to agree with God, to change their thinking. Now, it's very interesting that in the Old Testament, one of the ways, and we don't really see it couched this way often, uh, but it talks about the fear of the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that you're walking around afraid that God's going to zap you upside the head. But the idea of being in reverence, in awe, uh, that is the word fear. Uh, it's, it's really about worshiping Him, honoring Him, respecting Him. But it's also about changing your thinking, really, is what it is. The fear of the Lord means I change my thinking from whatever it is that I see, whatever it is that I think is my decision, my choice, and I fear the Lord, I begin to think like He thinks, I begin to change my thinking. Now, now listen to this. You know, there are two things that, at least two things, in the Old Testament that happen when you begin to fear the Lord. And here they are. Number one, He says you'll get understanding. Understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding, it says in Proverbs. You'll begin to have understanding about life. Do you know what happens when you get understanding? You get perspective. Uh, you're able to overcome storms, right? Okay? Because if you understand, you're not afraid. If you understand, you understand the purpose, okay? God wants to give you understanding, but then the other thing, Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Understanding is what you know. Wisdom is what you do with it, right? I mean, I heard it said this way. Understanding or knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in fruit salad. Okay? So what God wants us to see is that he wants us to change our thinking. 2 Corinthians 3.14, but their minds were hardened for to this day where when they uh, read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is that veil taken away. In other words, they had hard hearts because they were blind to who Jesus is. And he says, if you want to get better, if you want to examine your heart, if you want to have understanding about what all this means, then turn to Christ. Here's the beauty of it. The Bible says in James, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Remember wisdom, dealing with fear of the Lord. If he says, if you lack wisdom, ask God, and he'll give it to you generously. He's not going to hold back. He's not going to say, oh, you just get a little bit. He's going to pour out wisdom on you when you ask. Isn't that cool? And the disciples began to understand. Um, John 12, 39 and 40, Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. So what is the enemy? What is Jesus really dealing with in this? Why did they not understand? Why were their hearts hard? Well, according to Scripture, it's because they didn't believe. That was it. Unbelief. Now, you would think that it would be kind of easy to believe if you just saw Jesus feed 5,000 people and their families with five loaves and two fish and that he walked on water, and that he got Peter also to walk on water, and that he calmed a storm. He just had to speak. He got in the boat, and it completely... I mean, how many more miracles have to happen before you believe? But before we get too hard on these guys, we're just like that. I mean, we, we know that God answers prayer, but we don't believe he's going to answer ours. We know that he promises to provide, and yet we worry, and we have coffee and cigarettes and fingernails for breakfast every morning. 
We're so worried. We don't give it to the Lord. We know. We've seen it. We've understood that God alone can provide, that He has power over circumstances, but we don't really believe. We know that God can save our kids, but we don't really believe it. I mean, we pray for it, but we don't really believe it's going to happen. We, we beg God and we act like you got to just like wear Him down. And my point is this. Why did Jesus walk on water? Well, He did it to show who He is. And He did it to let us know that He's with us in a storm. We can survive a storm because of Him. But I think He really did it mainly for us to look into our heart and ask ourselves the question, do I really believe? And he'll help you with that. Because in James, he said, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. And he gives to everyone liberally. That's the old King James. He gives it abundantly. You ever give something, you know what Jesus did? with the five loaves and two fish, he gave liberally. In fact, not only did he feed all those people, but there were 12 baskets of leftovers. And what is the point? I think we need to understand that when we lack wisdom, when we lack belief, when we lack the understanding, we ask of God. We turn to him, and he will help you believe. Isn't that cool? He asks us to have faith, and then when we ask Him, He'll give us the faith. Heavenly Father, help us today to trust You. Help us to believe. I know that for all of us, Lord, there are times that we struggle with belief. There are times when we get it. There are times we don't. And so, Lord, I pray that You would uh, just help us today. Help us to understand. Help us to believe. And Lord, I pray that you just uh, bless today and this next service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me just say this. Some of you are watching online, and um, maybe today you need to ask Christ to be your Savior. Maybe you're in the room and you need that. And here's what I want you to understand. The belief is from God. Now, if you're going to say, you know what, I need to have every question answered before I come, that's not faith. You don't even have every question answered before you ask the girl that you're dating to marry you. You don't have all the answers. Will she stay with me the rest of her life? I hope so. Don't know. What is she going to be like after we get married? Will she be as nice to me after we're married as she is now? Probably not, but you don't know, okay? I mean, look, we don't have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed before we get married. Why would you think that you have to have every answer to every question before you turn to Him? You don't have to have all the answers. You just need one answer, and that's Jesus. And you can turn to Him. And so today, you can turn to Him in faith. You can turn to Him and ask Him to save you. And today, if you'd like to do that, I would encourage you, just call out to God. Ask Him to be your Savior. If you're in the room and you need to do that, please take a moment and put, that, put your name on that red card, uh, the next step card. Check at the bottom. It says, I prayed to receive Christ today, and uh, we'll help you take your next step. If you'd like to come and pray with someone on our prayer team after the service, you can come up front, you can take communion, you can pray, uh, you can share with them, and uh, they'll be here to help you. But thank you so much for being here with us today. I hope you'll think about this message. This is one of those messages I hope you'll chew on and think about and ask yourself about your own heart. And I believe when you do, God will reveal himself to you. Let's everyone stand. Thank you for being here with us today. Don't forget that Mother's Day is next week. Invite your family. Invite your friends. Invite your neighbors. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next week.